And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, Lord, for those that are here. I thank you, Lord, for those that are still on their way, and I thank you for those watching online. I just ask again, Lord, that each person receive from the Spirit of God the truth that you want them to receive. Help me to be yielded to you, Lord. I yield to you the best I know how, spirit, soul, and body, mind, heart, and tongue, yielded to you, a willing vessel to be used by you, that I speak nothing of the flesh, but only by your spirit. And I thank you, Lord, that you are blessing your people, and you are blessing this church according to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. So, you know, Christmas means different things to different people. Uh, so, so for some, it's an opportunity for excitement, family gatherings, taking vacation, extra days off of work. Um, it means different things to different people. And none of that's bad. All of that's fine. Uh, for others, it's a time for spending too much money on expensive gifts, perhaps an extended debt that you build up that you have to pay for for the next few months. For others, it's, uh, for, for, for most people, I think, it's a celebration of a fictional old man who lives at the North Pole, who flies around the world giving gifts. Still, for others, it's a time of sadness, loneliness, and depression. But Christmas is meant to be a celebration of the birth of Jesus. And in every gathering or every opportunity that I get, I try to bring the focus back to that. Because, you know, you go to family gatherings and other workplace gatherings, school gatherings, or whatever, and it seems like there's a celebration of everything and anything except for Jesus. It's, it's almost like if this is supposed to be the birthday of Jesus that we're celebrating, and I know he wasn't born in December, but that's beside the point. <laughs> if this is supposed to be the birthday of Jesus, how come there's talk about anything and everything else except Jesus? So uh, I usually try to bring the focus back to Jesus when, when we uh, gather in, in any form. But, you know, we have... The Gospels, we have the four Gospels, and all four Gospels, really the whole Bible is about Jesus. You know, when we want to learn more about Jesus, perhaps we go to the Gospels, but really the whole Bible is about Jesus, from cover to cover. It's not even just the New Testament. The whole, the whole Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, it's all about Jesus, from cover to cover. But specifically to talk about the four Gospels, there's Matthew, there, there's four Gospels, and you might wonder, well, why in the world do we need four Gospels? Why do we need to tell the story four times? But each story is told slightly different because they have different purposes, they have different focuses. Matthew wrote to a Jewish audience, and it's, it's discussing fulfilled prophecy, and it's presenting Jesus as the promised Messiah. Mark wrote to the Romans, and he was presenting Jesus as a, a man of power and authority. Luke wrote to the Gentiles, and he was presenting, largely he was presenting the humanity of Jesus. And he refers to Jesus as the Son of Man. John wrote to the, Greek and, the Greeks, and he was presenting the kingship and the lordship and the deity of Jesus. But today... And we could take any of the four Gospels to talk about Jesus, but I primarily want to focus on the, the Nativity story as seen in the Gospel of Luke. And in Luke, the first four verses say, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they deliver them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. There's a few things I want you to, to understand about this introduction by Luke. First of all, Luke was a physician. He's mostly known for being a physician, but he was also a missionary. He was a historian. He was an author, and he was a traveling companion of Paul. But I think there's a lot more to Luke than what we know. 
because the way he writes, this is personal opinion, <laughs> I think that he was involved in a greater capacity, in, and I don't know to what capacity, but he was involved in some capacity with Christianity long before he met Paul. You know, when he met up with Paul, he became a traveling companion of Paul, but, but I think he was involved in Christianity long before he met up with Paul. Um, but he reveals that this writing is a letter, and he presents the reason for the letter. Luke is writing, uh, he, he is writing the most historical account of Jesus. It's the longest of the four Gospels, and he gives more details. He especially gives more details about Mary. I've noticed that he, the, the detail that he gives about Mary, I think is significant. I think that he must have known Mary to some capacity and, and gotten a lot of his information directly from Mary. Because he not only tells what Mary did, he tells what she was thinking. <laughs> you, know, she, you know, it says things like she treasured these things in her heart and things like that. It says that at least twice that I'm aware of. She treasured these things in her heart. In other words, she continued to meditate on these things. How does he know? <laughs> of course, we would say he knows by the Holy Spirit. But I think that he must have gotten a lot of firsthand information directly from Mary. Because he does give more detail about her, I think, than the other Gospels do. But... One thing Luke says in this introduction is that he's setting things in order. In other words, I believe that this is in chronological order. Probably if there's a contradiction in the chronology between this gospel or any other gospel, this one probably is more chronologically accurate, I'm assuming. And he states that there have been many eyewitnesses that had already written about these things. And even though many eyewitnesses had already written about these things, he felt that he needed to write something and what does he say here? He says, I had perfect understanding from the very first. Well, what is it that gives Luke perfect understanding, as he says, from the very first? Okay, see that in verse 3. He had perfect understanding from the very first. What was it that gave Luke perfect understanding from the very first? I don't know for sure because... The Bible doesn't say, and anything that we say that's not in the Bible is purely speculation, but of the thousands upon thousands of followers of Jesus during his, his ministry years, we know that Luke was not one of the original 12 of the inner circle. But is it possible that he might have been among the larger crowd of followers? You know, there was thousands of people that came to hear Jesus' sermons. Perhaps Luke was in some of those crowds. There's, in Luke 10... Well, actually, in Luke 9, he sends out the 12 apostles and, and, and uh, has them perform miracles and healing. And then in, in Luke 10, he sends out the 70. Is it possible that Luke was among the 70? I think that's only mentioned in Luke, where he sends out the 70. And I could be wrong. That might be mentioned in Matthew too, but I'm thinking it's only mentioned in Luke, where he sends out the 70, and perhaps Luke was among those 70. I don't know. But anyway, it's written to a man by the name of Theophilus. Theophilus comes from two words, theos, meaning God, and basically phileo, which means love. So Theophilus means lover, it either means lover of God or loved by God. There's debate on whether it means lover of God or loved by God. But either way, if you are a lover of God or if you're loved by God, this is written to you. And then he follows up with Acts as the sequel to Luke, and it's also addressed to Theophilus. But Luke does not really record where Jesus began. Actually, John's gospel does a better job of discussing the very beginning of Jesus, because he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And by, by that, I basically am telling you that Jesus existed long before his birth. You know, a lot of times we think that Jesus began in the manger in Bethlehem, but he existed long before that. The Bible identifies Jesus as eternally pre-existing, as the eternal God, as the creator. There's numerous pre-incarnate appearances of Jesus. He's not known as Jesus in the Old Testament, but he does appear as the Son of God, as the creator. There's at least three places in the New Testament that identified Jesus as the creator, which we're not going to get into that today, but Jesus is indeed God 
He is God of all gods. He is Lord of all lords. He is the creator. He is, um, and I know he is a triune God, but even in the creation, in the beginning was Elohim, and the word Elohim is three in one. It's a plural word. He is three in one. So Jesus is God manifested in the flesh, and we see him throughout the Old Testament in Genesis. I would say even in Genesis, in, 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 the, in the Garden of Eden, where it says the, Adam heard the voice of God walking in the garden. It doesn't say he heard God walking. It says he heard the voice of God, the voice of God walking. And I believe that that voice of God walking is the word of God, and Jesus is the word of God. So I believe that that was even Jesus, a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus in the Garden of Eden. And we see him appearing again and again as Melchizedek in Genesis 14, at Mamre in Genesis 18, um, in, in or I think that's, that's actually 16, at Mamre, and then at Bethel in, in Genesis 18. But he appears over and over and over again in the Old Testament, many times it refers to the angel of the Lord, and we believe that that is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. The fourth man in the fire in the book of Daniel was, was a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. In other words, he appears over and over and over again in the Old Testament. He's not known as Jesus, but he is recognized as the Son of God throughout the Old Testament. But the Bible prophesied in the Old Testament that the Messiah was coming and he was going to be birthed of a virgin. In fact, in Isaiah, it tells us in chapter 7, therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and uh, his name will be called Emmanuel. Emmanuel. And so let me tell you, let me tell you what Christmas is all about this morning. Truthfully, it's not about a baby. Thank God he came, and he came as a baby. But it's not about worshiping a baby forever and ever. It's not about a drummer boy. Somebody mentioned drummer boy earlier this morning. It's, not, it's certainly not about Santa Claus. It's not about Frosty. It's not about flying reindeer. It's about Emmanuel. This is what it's all about. It's about Emmanuel. What is Emmanuel? God with us. That's what it's all about. It's about God with us. It's about God taking up residence with us and in us. That's what it's all about. That God, the creator of the universe, decided to come to earth as a human being. And he, comes, he came as a human being. He lived 33 years on earth, died for us, and then he takes up residence by his spirit within us. It's God with us. That's what it's all about. That's what we should be celebrating. And nothing demonstrates his commitment, his love, his faithfulness, more than the fact that he became a man. This is not a plan that anybody could have dreamt up. This is something only God would do. God himself. You know, all religions of the world are all about what you do to earn salvation. But God, Christianity, is God coming to the earth and taking our place. Identifying with us fully and completely by becoming human. And then going to the cross and taking our full punishment dying in our place. It's the incarnation. The incarnation is all about God's commitment, his love, his faithfulness, his faithfulness toward man. And he demonstrated it by becoming one of us, irreversibly identifying with man for eternity. And there are literally hundreds of prophecies in the Old Testament that prophesy the coming of the Messiah. Some of them are kind of vague and, and you have to really do a deep study to figure out what it's talking about. But some of them, like this one, are more obvious. It's very clearly talking about Jesus, right? I don't think anyone can deny that this is talking about Jesus. And the next one, I think I've got another one up there on from Isaiah 9. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulders. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. This is what it's all about, God becoming man, God becoming one of us and being exalted. And he indeed is our wonderful counselor. He indeed is our mighty God. He indeed is the Prince of Peace. Praise God. 
Well, let's go back to Luke, and let's look at a few, a few scriptures in Luke. Luke chapter 1, verse 28. The angel came unto her, referring to Mary, and said, Hail, thou, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. When she saw him, the angel, she was troubled by his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. So the angel, the angel's greeting, in the King James it says hail, in the NIV it says greetings, but a better translation would be rejoice. She doesn't say just greetings or hail, she says rejoice, the angel says rejoice, you are highly favored. Praise God. So he, he brings a, a, a reassuring word, a positive word, an encouraging word. And then in verse 30, the angel said to her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the, the, son of the highest. And the Lord shall give unto him the throne of his father David. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing that I, have, that I know not a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So the promise here is a one-of-a-kind king, coming to earth and arriving in a one-of-a-kind way, the virgin birth. It never happened before. It never happened since. The angel told Mary that, that um, in addition to that, if we were to go on, we're going to skip a lot of verses here to get to the meat of the story, but the angel also tells her that her barren cousin Elizabeth was, was also going to have a child in her old age. And so the next few verses, Mary goes to visit Elizabeth. And we're also told in Matthew, I think this is only recorded in Matthew, that, that Joseph is told in a dream. Because Joseph, you see, Joseph is told, that, or he finds out that his, that his fiancée is pregnant, and he knows that it's not his child. So, um, you know, this story about the Holy Spirit coming upon you and making you pregnant may, might be a little bit hard to, to believe. <laughs> but, but he is told in a dream that it is true. And because he was contemplating on what to do because he was a righteous man. He, being a religious man, the law says that Mary should be stoned if she had been unfaithful to Joseph. She, she could have been stoned. But Joseph's love for her and his righteousness that he had his right standing with God would not allow him to take such drastic action. So he, he wanted to put her away quietly or, or in the relationship quietly. But he was told in a dream to go ahead and take her as his wife because indeed it is a child of the Holy Spirit. And so he's informed and so he, he accepts that. And so he takes Mary as his wife and embraces the child as his own. Uh, and he's also told to name the child Jesus. And he's given the responsibility of taking care of, of the, the family and providing for them. So in Luke chapter 2, let's continue the story as it's told in Luke. We're go going to hit a few verses in Luke chapter 2. Uh, the, in verses 4 through 7, Joseph went from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that when they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room in the inn. So th they had to go to Bethlehem because of the census. But... I want you to think about a few things here that perhaps you haven't thought about before. Or maybe you have. But because there was a census going on, and this is the first time, from my understanding, this was the first time that there was an attempt for a worldwide census, or at least an empire-wide census. 
And so this was a major endeavor that the, that the Roman government was doing. And so if you're of a certain lineage, you had to go to Bethlehem. And don't you know, it wasn't just Joseph and Mary on their way to Bethlehem, but there was probably hundreds, if not thousands of people going to Bethlehem, this small town, which is probably a very small town, perhaps only one inn, perhaps only one what we would call a motel. But there were thousands, probably thousands of people invading this small town. And if there was no place, no room available for Joseph and Mary, don't you think that there's probably no room for hundreds or thousands of other people? So I'm thinking they found this stable or they were told about this stable. Some people say it was just a cave, but whatever it was, they found this place where they could spend the night. But I kind of speculate they may not have been the only people in that stable because there's no room for a lot of other people probably also. So that there may have been, the nativity scene as we see it is probably very inaccurate in many ways. <laughs> First of all, the three wise men came along much later. They were not at the, the, the stable. But, and we don't even know that it was three wise men. It was wise men. It doesn't say there were three. It mentions three gifts, but it doesn't say there were three wise men. But, but they, they arrive in this stable and perhaps... There are other people already staying there because there was no motel room available for them either. So they probably didn't even have a private setting just for themselves. They probably had to share the stable. I'm, and again, I'm just speculating, but if you really think about the fact that there were probably thousands of people in town with no room to stay in, uh, many of them probably had family members they could stay with, but many probably did not. So that stable could have been quite crowded. And, but another thing I noticed here is that it mentions that, that uh, she gave birth to her firstborn son. Her firstborn son. I think that's significant because there are some groups, or at least one particular <laughs> group, that believes that Mary remained a virgin for her entire life. But this mentions that this is her firstborn son, which implies that she had other children. And we know from other scripture that she had at least six hundred six other children, because it mentions four brothers by name and it mentions sisters plural. So there were at least six other children. Mary had at least seven children, but this was her first child, and um, it meant so. This is the birth of the king. There, there is much discussion and debate and disagreement on the date of Jesus's birth. I think most Protestants, at least, universally agree Jesus probably was not born in December. Most of us think that Jesus was probably born right around the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, other people, which is in the fall, well, late summer, early fall, probably in September. Some people believe that he was born perhaps in, in spring. But whatever the date, we don't know. And so if we want to randomly, somewhere in history, and you can... I'm not going to get into the story of how it became December 25th. Let's just say history made the birthday of Jesus December 25th. And so it's not worth debating what the date of Jesus' birth is, as far as I'm concerned. If we chose this day to celebrate his birth, then praise God, let's just celebrate his birth. In fact, we have a birthday cake for Jesus over here for after the service. Because it is a birthday, <laughs> and we should celebrate. Another thing is when we celebrate somebody's birthday, we don't just reminisce about the day they were born, right? When we celebrate somebody's birthday, we celebrate them. We celebrate their life and what they've accomplished, perhaps. But, but it's not, I don't think celebrating the Lord's birthday has to be remembering the birth of Jesus all the time. But um, it's good to talk about his birth. A lot of miracles took place surrounding his birth. But it's all about celebrating Jesus himself. Praise God. The way you listen to some of these Christmas songs <laughs> is uh, you almost get the impression that Jesus is still a baby in the manger. But that's, you know, it's, it's a miracle that took place and we rejoice in that miracle that took place. Praise God. But Jesus was, was, uh, Jesus was born probably around the Feast of Tabernacles. But if we chose December 25th to celebrate it, that's fine. But the, the important thing is that God became a man. God himself, the creator of the universe, revealed himself in the form of a man. 
We don't have to go chasing after God. We don't have to go searching for God. God revealed himself. He, came, he became a man. He revealed himself. God himself, the creator of the universe, made himself knowable and touchable to the human race. And the next thing we see, if we skip down to verse 10, the angels announce the birth, to, uh, the birth of Jesus to the shepherds. The angels, the angel, that was one angel, said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. So that night an angel appeared to the shepherds and explained that a Savior was being born in Bethlehem, and the angel identified the baby as the Messiah, the anointed one, and the, the prophet, the priest, and the king that was prophesied throughout the Old Testament. And the angel also identified the baby as the Lord. Now the word that's used here for Lord is kurios, which means master and owner. So he introduces this newborn baby as your master and owner. <laughs> the master and owner of, the, of, of earth. I and mean, that's what that word Lord means in it, the, the, the Greek word kurios. All right, verse 12. And this shall be a sign to you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angels a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So apparently there was just one angel at first, but then suddenly a whole multitude of angels appear and begin to offer praise to God. Now, some have misquoted this as saying peace toward men of goodwill, but that's not correct. Goodwill is referring to God's goodwill. It's God's work, not man's work. Men are the objects of God's goodwill. Man, man is the object of God's good pleasure. But the hope of the world is not in good men, but the hope of the world is in a good God and his love that he extends towards men or towards mankind praise God so the shepherds quickly went and looked for Jesus they found Jesus and they told Mary and Joseph the story of the angel and what what just took place and again it tells us that Mary treasured these words in her heart and again I think Luke had some kind of connection to Mary some kind of knowledge of Mary some kind of relationship um, a strong bond of friendship and got a lot of his information directly from Mary, just like Mark. Mark also wasn't one of the original 12, but it's believed that Mark got his information from Peter, that Mark almost could be called the gospel according to Peter, <laughs> but it was penned by Mark. I don't know if, if you guys knew that, but a lot of people believe that, that Mark is actually the thoughts and the memory of Peter, whereas Luke, probably a lot of it anyway, has to do with, with what Mary had related to Luke. And again, it's speculation, but that's uh, it, that would make sense. So, one one final story I want us to look at, also in Luke two, is is Simeon and Anna. Simeon and Anna are two people that are largely overlooked, I think, in the story of Christmas. But let's skip down to verse twenty five. Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. The same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. Now, first of all, this, this was taking place the 40th day after Jesus was born. And the law required a dedication, a dedication ritual on the 40th day of the firstborn. If you, if you were to study back in the book of Exodus, the firstborn son had to be dedicated to the Lord for, for his purposes. And so they took the child to the temple to dedicate this firstborn son to God. And Simeon, this old man, appears. Now, the word Simeon means hears and obeys. And this is a man that truly heard God and he obeyed God. And he, it tells us that he was just, he was devout, and he was expectant, expect, expectantly waiting for the Messiah to appear. And it goes on in verse 26, and it was revealed to him, and to Simeon, by the Holy Ghost, that he should not see death before that he had seen the Lord's Christ. 
And he came by the Spirit to the temple, and when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law. Now let me stop here and, and mention that in these three verses, 20, 25, 26, and 27, the Holy Spirit is mentioned three times. The Holy Spirit was upon this guy. It's mentioned in all three of those verses that, that he was being led by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit was upon him, he was hearing the Holy Spirit, he was listening to the Holy Spirit, he was in tune with the Holy Spirit. That's very clear in these scriptures. He had a strong connection with the Holy Spirit. And he was a very spiritually man, a very spiritually aware man. He was very focused on the things of God. And it tells us that he was an elderly man. Actually, history tells us, or some commentaries tell you that he was, well, he was probably well over 100 years old. Um, so he, he, was, he was probably quite old. Now, we don't know exactly how old he was, but it tells us with Anna, which, which we'll talk about in a minute, it tells us that she was 84. It tells right in the, in the text that she was 84, and it's believed that Simeon was probably much older than that. But he was listening to the Spirit. He was in tune with the Spirit, and three times the Holy Spirit is mentioned to let us know that the Holy Spirit didn't come around just on the day of Pentecost. <laughs> The Holy Spirit was around long before the day of Pentecost. And under the Old Covenant, because they were still under the Old Covenant system, the Holy Spirit would, be, would come upon prophet, prophets, priests, and kings. And this man, Simeon, as well as Anna, were functioning in the office of a prophet or prophetess, prophet and prophetess. It's possible that Simeon might have had some other role. He might have been a priest. I don't know, but he, he clearly was functioning as an Old Covenant prophet. And in verse 28, Then took he, Simeon, him, Jesus, up in his arms, and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. So Simeon here worships God, for faithfully keeping his word. He was being kept alive, and God told him that you will not die until you see the Christ. And he, now that he saw the Christ, he says, okay, Lord, I'm ready to go now. We've talked in the past about Psalm 91, 16, with long life I will satisfy you <laughs> and show you my salvation. And he, now that he saw God's salvation, Jesus, he was satisfied and he was ready to go. Praise God. So, and mentioning that, he says, he refers to Jesus as God's salvation. Do you see that? He says that my eyes, in verse 30, my eyes have seen thy salvation. Now, Jesus, Simeon, even though this was, the New Testament is written largely in Greek, Simeon probably was not speaking Greek. He was probably speaking Hebrew. And so what he probably said in a literal Hebrew is that God, you, you have shown me your Yeshua. Because Yeshua is the Hebrew word for salvation, or it's translated salvation, but it's also the Hebrew word for Jesus. Jesus means salvation. So he probably literally said that you have shown me your Yeshua. Which I, I f find this interesting because... Salvation isn't something you do. Salvation is someone you know. Salvation is a person. Jesus never said, my examples are the way, truth, and life. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus never said, follow my example. He says, follow, or he doesn't say, follow my teachings. He says, follow me. Jesus personally is our salvation. It's not just he's showing us the way of salvation. He himself is our salvation. He is our Yeshua. So God prepared Jesus Christ and revealed him as the path for salvation for all people. I think those last two words are significant too. For all people. Why is that significant? Because most Jews, most Hebrews, most Israelites believed that when the Messiah came, he was going to be the Messiah for them. So the significance here is Simeon is revealing 
to Mary and Joseph, this is not just about the Jewish people anymore. It's not just about the descendants of Abraham, but this is a salvation that's available for all people. Praise God for that. And verse 32, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel and Joseph and Mary and Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him and Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother behold this child is set forth or set for the fall and rising again of Israel and for a sign which shall be spoken against yea a sword shall pierce through thy soul also that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. There, there's so much in here that we could talk about, but let me mention verse 34, that Simeon mentions a sign which shall be spoken against. What is the sign which shall be spoken against? I've heard different speculations as far as what Simeon was talking about. I think he was talking about the resurrection, that, that in, in the end, he will, he will have to die, but he'll be resurrected. And that's reflected in the verse 35 saying that your soul is going to be pierced also. Um, but the sign that many people speak against is the resurrection, the crucifixion and the resurrection. We tend to celebrate the crib and the, the, the nativity, the birth, the, 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 uh, the manger. But the most important event in the life of Jesus is his death. <laughs> The most important thing is not just his birth. Thank God that he was born. Thank God he came the way the prophet said he would come. But the most significant thing is his death and his resurrection. Without that, you know, there, there really wouldn't be much hope for us. But, but even, even to this day, people try to disprove the resurrection of Jesus. That's why I'm saying that that's the sign that is spoken against. The fact that he was resurrected. Many people try to disprove that. But the testimony of many witnesses, including the apostles, most of the apostles, all except for John anyway, died a martyr's death defending the resurrection. You don't die for something that you know isn't true. <laughs> but they died a martyr's death defending the resurrection. You know, they maintained the same confession without compromising their testimony. Even, even, if, they, even if we didn't have their testimony... We have a greater testimony within our own hearts that bears witness that bears witness with us that Jesus is indeed resurrected, and the the and the fact that He is alive. Now, the next several verses, which we're not going to get into for the sake of time, but the next several verses after this talk about the prophetess Anna, which it, very similarly she approaches Mary and Joseph. It's the same the same story at the temple when. They went for the dedication, um, and the, Anna said some of the, some very similar things. She it tells us in the context that she was she supernaturally became aware that this is the promised Messiah, and she prophesies. Now, some people refer to this as the uh, Simeon's song or Anna's song, but I don't think they were necessarily songs. I think that they they just spoke prophecies. They prophesied over over the child. And you might ask, well, what is really so important about Simeon and Anna? There's a couple of things that I have jotted down that I think that are significant. And you might say, well, if it's, if it's so significant, why is it only mentioned in Luke's gospel? And again, I think Luke got a lot of his information directly from, from Mary. But God, first of all, we see that God is interested in people of all ages. We see in this story an infant, but we also see elderly people. And God is interested in you no matter where you are in life. God is interested in you, uh, no matter how young you are or how old you are. But they both also dedicated their long lives to serving God. They, they, they could hear God's voice. They were focused on God, and they were tuned into God. They were tuned into the Holy Spirit. Both of these people lived long lives, and they lived long lives dedicated to God. It tells us about Anna that she 
was a widow ever since she was in her 20s. So, and she dedicated her life ever since then to service in the temple. So 50, maybe 60 years serving in the temple. Serving God, tuning into God, spending a lot of time in prayer, I'm sure. And we also see that they both, they both are said to have the Holy Spirit. They both ministered prophetically. They both worshiped God. And this also tells me what we call the silent years. You know, after Malachi and the beginning of Matthew, there's about 400 years, and this is referred to by many people as the silent years. I kind of suspect the silent years really weren't all that silent. <laughs> Because I think the Holy Spirit is always speaking, we're just not always listening. You know, just because there's no book written doesn't mean the Holy Spirit wasn't speaking. I think God has always had his prophets. He has always had people that would tune into him. And we see these, these elderly people, Simeon and Anna, clearly in tune with the Holy Spirit. So just because people say those years were the silent years, they say, well, God wasn't speaking during those 400 years. Yeah, I believe God was speaking. I believe he was always speaking. It's just that those, whatever God was saying wasn't being written down. It wasn't being documented. And, but, but he always had his prophets. And God is still speaking. And he's speaking to you if you'll listen to him. There's just a need for us to tune in to what the Holy Spirit is saying. But God always has someone that he can speak to and speak through. So let's, uh, let's begin to bring this to a close. And I want to um, just reemphasize that it's all about celebrating Jesus. Keep Christ in Christmas. Whatever you do, you know, uh, as you go home and spend time with your family or where, whatever you tend to do for the rest of the day, keep it focused on Jesus as much as you can. It's not about the parties. It's not even really... Um, you know, thank God for family, but keep it focused on Jesus as much as possible. It's all about Emmanuel. It's all about God with us. The fact that he came to the earth, he, he like I said earlier, he, he made God knowable. He made God touchable. He came by his Holy Spirit to reside within us. He is Emmanuel. God taking up residence with us and in us. And I think I have uh, another scripture in Philippians that should be on the screen and we'll close with this and then we're going to get into communion. Having this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus who though he was in the form of God did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. Okay, so he came, he made himself nothing, taking on the form of a servant. I just noticed that my uh, ESV is different than the ESV up there, so sometimes that happens. But it, he, he emptied himself or he made himself nothing by becoming a servant, being born in the likeness of men. So this baby came, but this is not just an ordinary baby. <laughs> this is God manifested in the flesh. But as I said a few minutes ago, the most important thing about Jesus is not just his birth. The most important thing is what he did at the end of his earthly life. He made himself the sacrifice. And that's what we remember with communion, that, that he, he took our place on the cross. He took, he came and he lived that perfectly righteous life that we couldn't live. Then he took our sins upon himself on the cross and died our death for us, taking our sins upon himself, taking even the punishment for our sins upon himself. And so this baby grew up and he was crucified for each of us. And this is sincerely really the most important event in history the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. So let's, uh, let's, going back to Luke, the Gospel of Luke, since I've been in Luke most of the morning, I wanted to take the communion reference from Luke. Luke 22, verses 19 and 20. He took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and giving thanks, saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in, rem in remembrance of me. Likewise, 
he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. What I would like for you to do is why don't you just come up and take, whoops, take the bread. Just um, come, yeah. Just come, come and get it yourself. We don't, we don't have an usher this morning. Be your, be your own usher. And Stephen, that's okay. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the fact that you did come into the earth as Emmanuel, as God with us. And thank you, Lord, that it, it's, it, it's such a significant truth that we, I'm sure we, we don't fully grasp in our own heart, we don't grasp it in our own mind, the significance of God taking on flesh. And then you lived that righteous life, and then you went to the cross, and you took all of our sins upon yourself. You took all of our pain. You took all our suffering. You took the, the results of the curse upon yourself. You took the full curse upon yourself and the full punishment for any sins that we've ever committed upon yourself. And right now, Lord, I just ask you, Lord, that each person here receive a special blessing from you this morning. Whatever it is that they need, that they'll receive it, they'll, re they'll receive the answer to their prayer this morning as we partake of communion. And I would like for you to, whatever it is that you need this morning from the Lord that was clearly in Scripture provided through the cross, through the redemptive work of the cross, just receive it by faith. You know, the Scripture says, by his stripes you were healed. And he took the crown of thorns on his head. To me, that means he took mental redemption for you also if there's you know if you if you're having trouble with memory or any mental issue he took the crown of thorns which pierced his skull you know for for your brain for your memory for your mind he took the the nails in his hands which symbolize the works of your hands so you everything you set your hands to should prosper because of the nails that went through his hands. And he put, he took nails in his feet, which symbolize your path in life. So he wants to give you clear direction. You might think that life is kind of uncertain. You don't know, you don't know what direction to, to take. But he wants to provide divine guidance. The scripture says he'll lead you in a plain path. Claim those scriptures based upon what he did on the cross. And the spear that went through his side for spiritual wholeness, if you need the Holy Spirit baptism this morning, if you don't have the Holy Spirit baptism, you need the Holy Spirit baptism. <laughs> so you can receive that this morning. So, so I'll read um, verse 19 again, and then, then you can partake. He took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Go ahead and partake. And it's all because of his blood, his broken body and his blood. His blood makes you righteous. And it's because of the righteousness. See, you should never have the attitude, I'm a sinner saved by grace. No, you're no longer a sinner. You are the righteousness of God. He has imputed into you the very righteousness of Jesus. So you're no longer a sinner saved by grace. You are righteous because of his blood. 
claim that. And because you are, I know this, this sounds, the, the first time I heard this, it sounded like blasphemy. So, but you are just as righteous as Jesus. <laughs> because he imputed his righteousness in you. So God no longer looks at your sin. He no longer sees your sin. He sees you as righteous. He sees, when he looks at you, he sees the very righteousness of Jesus. And if you really understand that, if you really see that, if you really believe that, that should give you a boldness in your prayer life. That God doesn't, he has no remembrance of your sin. How can an all-knowing God have no remembrance of your sin? I don't know, but he chooses not to remember your sin. So you can go Go, go boldly before the throne of God, knowing that God sees you as righteous. Not just forgiven, because if you were just forgiven, God still might have a remembrance of your sin. So he, do, he goes far beyond forgiving you. He makes you righteous. You are righteous. So have that in mind as you partake. Likewise, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Go ahead and drink. Thank you, Lord, for your blood. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of righteousness. Thank you, Lord, for cleansing us. Not just forgiving us, but fully and completely cleansing us and making us righteous. We give you the praise and the thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord, for ministering to each person here. Thank you, Lord, for answering their prayers and meeting their needs. We give you the praise and the thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're not quite finished yet. Praise God. I want to, um, since it's Christmas, I want to acknowledge a few people that have been extremely helpful through the year. Annette, if you're watching, I've got one of these for you. <laughs> I, I, I meant to give this to you last week, but we'll give it to you next week. Um, and I didn't forget you, Alex, either. But I'll see you next week. All right. So first of all, let me start with, um, okay, Bob, Bob's not here today, but I've got one for him if he's watching. I've got something here for Rama. Rama has very faithfully leading us in praise and worship for the past year. And um, very, she comes all the way from Madison. I'm very, very grateful for what she does for us. Merry Christmas. Um, I don't think she's missed even one Sunday this year, have you? It's, it's, it, you've been very faithful uh, for, you know, since, since she started le leading praise and worship, she comes all the way from Madison, which is uh, almost a two-hour drive, and very dedicated to that, and we appreciate that. Uh, she's, she's, she leads praise and worship almost every Sunday, but once in a while, at least once a month, we have Charlie and Florencia Insco. So we have something for you too. Merry Christmas. Thank you for blessing us with, with your talent and, and your music. We appreciate that. And I have something here for the Elliott family. <laughs> um, the Elliots have been very faithful in what I introduced initially as the signs and wonder ministry, putting up the signs. And <laughs> but in, a, in addition to that, they frequently bring treats, like I see they brought some treats today. So uh, don't be in a hurry to leave. Uh, they've been a, a tremendous blessing to us. And I have something here for Stephen. Stephen joined us a few months ago and has been very faithful and dedicated and very helpful with the audio and video, the audio and video ministry, and it's very helpful. I have something for Bob, but he didn't show up. He, uh, he's been basically serving as our greeter for, for the most part. Uh, he's here almost every Sunday, and Annette, as you know, she's been very involved in the church in various capacities, so we have those also. So thank you, and God bless you, and before you leave, also... 
since it is Jesus' birthday that we're celebrating, there is a birthday cake here for Jesus. So, so does somebody want to sing happy birthday to Jesus? Okay, we can bypass that. We have, a, we have another song, what, what has become my favorite Christmas song, Unspeakable Joy, so we will close with that song. But if you need prayer for anything, feel free to talk to me and have some cake and snacks before you leave. <laughs>